Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thank you for coming to our January webinar. Um, I'm excited to be introducing this webinar. It's my first as the new director of CSEE. Um, I took on this role on January 1st, and we've got a great webinar here for you. Um, so just to introduce the center a little bit, we are a group of 27 um, faculty and researchers uh, here at the University of Texas at Austin uh, working on the general area of subsurface energy. So this covers a lot of ground. We have a lot of great expertise, a lot of good, a lot of good people here. Um, the research that goes on here in the center uh, encompasses everything from conventional oil and gas to CCUS and geothermal, um, you know, gas hydrates, that sort of thing. Um, we have a number of different technical disciplines that we work in, uh, a lot of reservoir engineering, but also a good amount of formation evaluation, petrophysics, machine learning. Um, sustainability is a growing area, so we're really covering the whole range of uh, sur subsurface engineering. And the tools we use to investigate these problems uh, include simulation, experiments both at the large and small scale, which I think you'll hear about um, later today, um, as well as software development and um, some really good uh, multidisciplinary um, work. A lot of our research is carried out um, through industrial affiliate programs. So these are programs where we collaborate with industry to support research in various areas. You can see the diverse range of IEPs that we have here, everything from hydraulic fracturing to enhanced oil recovery, reservoir simulation, um, unconventionals, digital rock physics, um, and reservoir characterization and, uh, and CCUS. And uh, if you're interested in any of these, you can visit our website or you can get in touch with me and I'll point you in the right direction. So uh, CSEE monthly webinars, this is the first of the calendar year 2024. Um, these are intended to be informative and industry driven. So we want to give you guys something that's of interest to industry, but also showcases the great work we're doing here at CSEE. We hold them on the second Tuesday of each month at noon central time, and these are on Teams. And you can look on our website or on our social media pages for announcements about upcoming webinars. Um, we upload them to our YouTube channel within a few days. So if you have to miss some of it or you miss the whole thing completely, just go check that YouTube channel. There's a lot of great stuff on there, and you can see all of our older webinars there as well. Uh, just to give you a couple of uh, some heads up here about what's coming up, um, February 13th, we'll have a webinar by Dr. Uh, Lyra Wong, who's a, a research scientist here. We're going to skip March 12th because that's spring break for us, and I know for a lot of y'all as well. Um, April 9th, we'll have Dr. Sharma, and then on April, uh, excuse me, May 14th, Dr. Rakuno. So these should all be good, uh, good webinars. Um, when, during the webinar, if you have any questions that come up, please type them into the Q&A section. And at the end of the talk, uh, we'll try to get through as many of those as possible. But go ahead, whenever it occurs to you, just, just jot it down in the Q&A and we'll get to it. Uh, one thing I want to point out, this is new this year, is we are offering um, sponsorship opportunities for these webinars. So this gives you a, a great um, you know, platform to advertise your, your company. Um, and, you know, we can have different uh, sponsors every month. And if you are interested in this, uh, please reach out to me and um, we can work out the details. But I think this could be a great opportunity uh, for some of you all out there. Now, it is my great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Balhoff, uh, who is um, a professor in this department. He's actually the department chair and former CSEE director. Um, he is going to be talking about microfluidics and micromodels for uh, screening for enhanced oil recovery. And um, it, it should be a very interesting talk. He's doing a lot of really uh, great work in the, uh, in the EOR area. So um, for those of you who don't know Dr. Balhoff, he um, is, like I said, professor and chair of the uh, uh, department here. And uh, he uh, co-leads the um, uh, Chemical Enhanced Oil Recovery um, IAP. He has a bachelor's and PhD in chemical engineering from Louisiana State University. He's an SPE distinguished member, and he uh, won the uh, Urine Award in, uh, in 2022. And he has uh, several other SPE awards. Um, he's you know, very well respected within the industry and within academia. And I'm really looking forward to uh, hearing what he has to say about his work today. So um, go ahead, Matt, when you're ready.
Uh, so the title of my uh, talk is Microfluidics and Micromodels as EOR Screening Tools. I want to thank uh, Dr. Daigle for the uh, nice introduction, and um, I want to welcome him as the new director of the center. Um, so uh, excellent choice, and I know he's got a, a wonderful vision for the center, and I look forward to working with him there. Um, I am going to talk about microfluidics and micromodels for EOR purposes. We've done quite a bit with um, carbon capture utilization and storage and other applications as well, but just in the interest of time, um, I'll kind of restrict it to EOR. But um, as you see, uh, I'm going to talk about a lot of different applications and they're clearly applicable to any subsurface uh, media. So, um, Micromodels for EOR applications. So a few of the applications that I'm going to talk about, um, a little bit about nanoparticle water flooding, uh, a little bit about low salinity water flooding, which as we know is, is a uh, very inexpensive, easy uh, IOR, EOR technique. Um, another something that I've uh, worked on for over a decade now is polymer flooding using polymers that are viscoelastic. In fact, uh, a year or so ago, I had a different webinar which uh, kind of discussed, uh, discussed the details of that. And uh, this was a core flood, uh, one of uh, several dozen, where we saw that if you had a viscoelastic polymer flood, that improved recovery significantly over an inelastic flood. Um, even if it had a similar viscosity or even if you were at quote unquote residual oil saturation. And so, um, you know, the nice thing about core floods is that they're they're real rocks, and um, you know, and they're practical in, in that sense. But they are relatively expensive; they're time consuming, and even though you get very good macroscopic results and data, it's very challenging to go to the very small scale and, and visualize. Um, you, of course, you can do micro CT scans, but then it's harder to do things at a larger scale. And, um, and so that's one of the motivations for doing microfluidics and micromodels. Uh, and the last thing that I'll talk a little bit about is some um, ASP floods and some visualizations that we see there. So um, I'm going to start out um, talking about some fabrication techniques. I don't want the focus of this talk to be on fabri fabrication, so this is kind of a quick review, but some of it is relevant to some of the stuff I'll talk about later. But um, there are lots of different materials we could use for microfluidics and micromodels. Uh, in our group, we've used PDMS, uh, but uh, we've mostly done glass. It's uh, inexpensive. It's relatively easy. It's uh, easily tailorable to the geometry. We can also tailor the wettability. And so that's some of the reasons why we, we use that. So um, the way we do this is we design our geometry of choice and we can choose almost any geometry we want um, in AutoCAD. And then we export the file externally to receive a mask. Uh, we use a, co uh, we coat a soda lime wafer with a 20 nanometer layer of chromium followed by a layer of copper. We, uh, by the way, we do all this fabrication in house with the exception of um, exporting it for the for the mask. Uh, we apply our fo uh, positive photoresist on the wafers. We transfer the patterns to the photoresist. We remove the UV exposed photoresist and underlying copper and chromium using copper and chromium etchant. Then we etch the exposed glass pattern using buffered oxide etchant. And then finally, we drill holes on the wafer at entry exit ports and thermally bonded wafers to another non-manipulated glass slide. So that's just a quick overview of what we do there. Um, the experts on this are really the students and postdocs uh, that have worked on this. So um, the presentation that I give today was probably done by uh, over a dozen different students and postdocs, and uh, I'll try to um, reference them where applicable when I do this. So uh, kind of a maybe a, a illustration of how this is done. So you got the exposure to UV, the copper removal. It's ready for etching. We use hydrofluoric acid to etch the glass. Then that's complete and then we're done. I would like to point out one thing and that is, is that uh, usually you have this uh, 45 degree angle uh, on the glass. It's uh, 45, you know, um, and, and that's not usually ideal. There's been a lot of attempts to remove that or to minimize it. Uh, I'm going to show later that we're going to take advantage of that. So while it's usually considered a um, 
something people don't want, uh, we're going to take advantage of it and, and use it uh, for our benefit. So uh, the experimental procedure for these is um, we're going to inject our fluids using syringe pumps we have in the lab. So you've got this syringe pump over here, so we can inject any fluids we want. We capture the displacement images with optical cameras. And so that's the really nice thing about microfluidics is that you can see in real time what's happening. You can take pictures, you can take videos uh, and, and really visualize what's happening. Uh, we capture the microscopic images using a stereoscope, calculate the fluid saturations with image J. Now, this is a really important point, um, and it's going to come up later in this webinar, is that unlike with core floods and other experimental techniques, we're not going to determine saturation, which, by the way, is a measure of volume, not mass, uh, using a mass balance at the exit. Uh, so the, the volumes are just too small to measure that. Instead, we're going to use um, software, visualization software with image J to determine those saturations. We're going to measure pressure drops using transducers across the micromodel. So we can do almost anything we can do with a, a core flood, right? So we can measure saturations, changes in saturations. We can measure pressure drops, flow rates. I'll show some other things that we could do. Um, and then in this case, we're going to perform everything in ambient conditions. OK, now, obviously, that that's not practical for um, you know some cases, but I make two points. The first is, is that high temperature and pressure are possible. Uh, they're just a little bit more more complicated and more expensive to, to do, but um, they're definitely possible. Many people have done them. The second point I'd like to make is, is that most of what I'm going to show today is really focused on physics and and understanding different kinds of things and uh, the vast majority that, that we can do at ambient conditions. But um, we, we do have an interest and a plan to do experiments at high temperature and pressure in the future. Um, so I'm going to go through um, a number of different works here and um, I'm going to uh, really go through a variety of different applications. And I'll also sort of start at a very, very small scale, which I'll call microfluidics, and go to larger scale, which I'll refer to as micro models and even you know core floods on a chip. But um, I'm going to start with some work that uh, Zeke did, a previous um, graduate student of mine and now a professor at Peking University, where he um, created this droplet poor throat generator. And so you can see a little microfluidic and what I'm calling a microfluidic device is just sort of a channel. And so he's got this over here creating these droplets, as you see here, and at a poor throat and um, where the poor body meets a poor throat, you'll have uh, some sort of non wetting droplet there. Um, and so here's some actual images of that. So here's our non wetting droplets and our wetting fluid. We can measure the size of that droplet, uh, the length, which we'll call L. Now, uh, Kud did a number of different experiments here, and what he found is that the droplet size that gets trapped right here decreases with increasing velocity or, or increasing capillary number, right? So you have the wetting fluid and the non-wetting fluid. Uh, these were glass chips, so they were water wet, but we can control that wettability. We looked at water, we looked at glycerin, we looked at other different fluids, but we all, you know, uh, for the most part, we saw the same thing, and we used decanter crude oil for the non-wetting fluid. As you can see, as we increase that flow rate or that capillary number, the size of that droplet decreased and eventually went away. Um, not really a surprise there, but what was interesting is, is that we were able to quantify it and predict it. So um, we did some work here. So could did some uh, a little bit of a physical model and um, some analysis to, to develop a, uh, a balance. And what he predicted was that the size of this droplet should be proportional to the capillary number to the minus one third. And so uh, when you do the experiments, and this is the size of the droplet versus the capillary number to the minus one third, it didn't matter whether uh, we were using water or water with surfactant or glycerin. It followed that correlation uh, perfectly um, for all practical purposes. So this includes surfactants. This included nanoparticles. In this case, 
um, you know, either way, whether it was water, whether it had surfactants, whether it had nanoparticles in there, whether we used glycerin, it followed that correlation. Okay, and so, um, you know, that was uh, really interesting there. Um, so then that brought us to the question, because as I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, I've long had an interest in viscoelastic polymers, and we've seen that viscoelastic polymers somehow behave differently. They produce more oil than uh, an inelastic polymer, uh, for example, or a fluid that's got a similar viscosity. And so we hypothesize that the viscoelastic polymer would actually shrink that droplet faster and it would pass through the throat faster than an equivalent inelastic fluid. And um, that was our hypothesis. What we found was actually the complete opposite, is that when you got to a point, and hopefully my little video works here, um, I might have to get rid of this. Um, I got some videos here these are elastic polymers, hydroxypolyacrylamide and polyethylene oxide. And what happens is when you get to a critical flow rate, instead of passing through the throat, it starts to vibrate or oscillate. Um, and we saw this only for elastic polymers. We didn't see it for inelastic fluids. So instead of passing through that throat sooner than uh, the inelastic fluid, it actually didn't pass through at all because it started to vibrate and oscillate, um, which was interesting. And um, we did, we went back to our force balance in a, in a postdoc of mine, Chi Yu Zi, um, who's a, a professor now in, um, in Beijing. Um, also, uh, he extended Ka's model to try to predict that. And so he included an elastic force. And what he found is the dimensionless droplet length was proportional to the capillary number to the minus one third, but there was a um, Deborah number in there. So the Deborah number is a dimensionless number that accounts for the elasticity. So if the Deborah number is zero, you just recover Co's model, but it's a little bit more complicated here. And what we find is that uh, for high flow rates or low capillary number minus one third, the size of that droplet sort of uh, tapered off and came to an asymptote. And that's predicted by this model. Um, and if we look at the, the amplitude of those oscillations that I talked about, so here's some actual data um, over here on the left. Um, and we we tried to, we, we did a, like a Fourier transform and we looked at the dimensionless amplitude versus the Deborah number. And what we found is that uh, regardless of the fluid and the velocity, we found that um, the amplitude was proportional to the Deborah number, um, and there was a critical Deborah number right around one. Okay, and so this was more of an empirical model, but uh, nonetheless um, helps us to understand that. So, of course, if the Deborah number is zero, then um, then there is no amplitude, there's no oscillation. Um, but if uh, you, you have a strong elastic fluid, whether through the fluid itself is elastic or the Deborah number could be increased with a higher velocity, then you get greater amplitude in those oscillations. Um, interestingly, Chi Yu, um, the, the, the postdoc, did some fine, uh, did some lattice Boltzmann simulations to understand that. And, and sure enough, if you had an inelastic fluid, whether it be Newtonian or shear thinning, um, it passed through the droplet just like our experiment shown. But um, if it was a viscoelastic fluid, you get these vibrations or oscillations. Um, and, and here's a plot of the distance of that non-wetting droplet from the center of the throat versus time. The blue curve is for a Newtonian fluid, which eventually passes through. The uh, red curve is the viscoelastic fluid, which um, never passes through. Um, now, uh, Hopefully you're asking a question that if my core flood shows that these viscoelastic fluids get more um, oil recovery, why is this showing that the oil actually never passes through the throats? It seems counterproductive. Um, I agree that was against our original hypothesis, uh, but since then it's helped us to develop new hypotheses. Um, I talk a lot about those in my other webinar on um, viscoelastic polymer flooding. But in short, it, it does certain things potentially like to act as a conformance control agent. So you might be able to block um, some pathways and produce oil in other places because it's doing this and then eventually maybe recover this oil. 
Uh, I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk about a different application. This is work done by a, a PhD student using Do, who's now a postdoc at Harvard University. Um, and she had done some experiments with uh, low and high salinity water. And uh, what we see here is, again, these are just channels with some dead end pores. Um, if you inject uh, relatively high salinity water, you, you get the oil trapped in these uh, dead end pores. That's what you see there in yellow. If you inject low salinity water, and in her case, I think she actually did zero salinity. She used some DI water, but, but she also did experiments with uh, relatively low salinity, maybe a couple thousand ppm. And um, she saw some really neat behavior. Um, what she didn't see with the high salinity water is that over time, and it was a time dependent phenomenon, that uh, she started to see some swelling of the oil. And, and as I'll show later, what was really happening is you're creating emulsions between the water and the oil. And um, that swelling was able to expand and, and I'll show how that can actually lead to increased um, recovery. I'd like to also mention in the slides that I'll show, uh, none of them involve clay. So there's been some debate in the literature as to whether or not low salinity water only worked um, in the presence of clay. Um, it certainly does work in the presence of clay, and that is a factor, but we'll show that um, it can be a factor even in the absence of clay. Um, so the contact angle, what we see there, decreases with time, which is interesting. Uh, Usually, put together some mechanisms for low salinity water flooding. Um, and as you see here, um, if you have high salinity water, the polar compound micelles in the oil phase um, uh, capture dissolved water and form small water droplets. That's what you see in the um, top over here. But if you have low salinity water, uh, you know, then what happens is that oil just de de detaches from the solid surface and you get wettability alteration. So um, it's really a, a chemical potential effect, as you can see here. So um, because of these micelles and these um, and um, and the because of the emulsions that form um, to be in chemical equilibrium, um, you get this change in a wettability and the swelling, and that's what we saw in that previous um, slide there. So. Uh, what I've shown so far is what I call microfluidics. Um, I, I, I make the distinction between microfluidics and micromodels as being microfluidics is sort of single channels or maybe a few channels. Micromodels are basically porous media on a chip. Um, easiest way to think of them is, is like little Lego chips, kind of like what I've shown over here. Um, but micromodels are, are useful for what we do with subsurface porous media. Um, so, Going back to what I talked to you about before, nice thing about doing core floods, and we do lots of core floods, um, we can control the rate pressure, we can record fluid cuts, pressure drops, outflow composition. In micro models, we can also control the injection rate and the geometry, right? Because we use AutoCAD, we can create almost any geometry we want. We can record fluid interface motion, pressure drops. Um, you know, here's a picture of, of some core floods. Usually in our lab, we like to use one foot long cores. Um, and, you know, here's some typical data that we would get from that. Uh, in a micro model, we can really zoom in and visualize things at different scales. Uh, we can do small scale, larger scale, different cameras and that kind of thing. Here are just some examples of some uh, microfluidic experiment, micro model experiments we've done in the past. Um, I want to point out in this, in this talk that uh, I in no way advocate for microfluidics or micromodels replacing core floods. Um, they will never do that. Um, we don't do it in my lab. We, we do both. Uh, what I do think micromodels can be is a complementary tool and they can be a screening tool. So uh, whereas core floods can be expensive and time consuming, micromodels are less expensive. They're less time consuming. You can visualize things, probably do uh, a half a dozen or a dozen experiments in parallel, and you can use them as screening tools and and then the ones that you like, then you could do the actual core floods. So you don't have to do dozens of core floods. So they are complementary tools. They're not um, in competition. 
So going back to some of Yujing's work where she was doing low salinity flooding, uh, she created a few different micromodel geometries. Um, and you can see uh, the one, um, you know, I, I have on top, you've got this um, kind of poor network. So you've got grains and pores. But if you zoom in, uh, we've also got a fracture um, in there. So if you go in on that, um, especially that bottom one, you, you see that there's a fracture in there. So we can create fractures and matrices and, and, and uh, different geometries that we like. Uh, so using did this experiment, and I think that this is the this is one without a fracture in it. And um, she did low salinity water flooding. And what happened is, is that um, at early times, she sort of reaches a steady state and she's got an unswept region and a swept region. OK, and that's typical, of course, of water flooding. And um, over time, early on, that doesn't change very much. But after a while, what she starts to see is some swelling that occurs. And I've got some of those circles over there. And then I've got a newly swept region, right? So the oil is in yellow. And um, you can see that over time that when we go from this black dashed line to this red dashed line, this space over here has now been swept where it really wasn't at early times. And uh, using attempted to try to better understand some of those low salinity mechanisms and what was happening. Um, so, uh, and this is sort of a, maybe a, a, you might consider it a minor point, but I think it's, it's a actually important critical point is that what we're proposing here is, is that the low salinity water is not reducing the residual oil saturation per se, but actually uh, improving sweep efficiency. Um, and that might be a little bit counterintuitive because we're not necessarily, we're not increasing the viscosity, right? So there's no improvement in mobility control in terms of viscosity, but we showed before we are changing the contact angle, which uh, may be changing the relative permeability curves. So um, we saw our, this already that we have oil dewetting and swelling in contact with the low salinity water. The non-swelling and swelled residual oil droplets better block the poor throats and the wetting and smaller residual oil films. And because of that, water was redirected towards a previously unswept region. And so what you see on the right, and this is just a qualitative conceptual curves, but this was uh, Yujing's explanation of a change in relative permeability due to this wettability change. And on the left, um, we see um, because of that swelling and de-wetting that you've got an increase in sweep efficiency. So uh, again, we're kind of going through different scales. So um, these are a little bit larger micro models. So instead of just the matrix part, now what we have is a matrix with a fracture in the center. Okay, and um, these are water wet. Okay, and so what we have here is that we're injecting water and it goes through the matrix. There's some imbibition that occurs. Okay, and um, again, we start with the high salinity water, right? And after 20 hours, we've sort of reached our steady state. In fact, I see very little difference between five hours and 20 hours. Uh, oil saturation is about 88%. So um, didn't do, uh, didn't produce a lot of oil. Most of it was in the, um, in the fracture, but there's some imbibition that occurs. If we start to inject low salinity water, in this case, low salinity, I mean, actually DI water, so zero salinity, um, not much happens for a while. Several pore volumes, uh, 23 hours, 30 hours, still 88%, nothing's happened. Uh, water's just going in and out. After about 45 hours though, we see that the oil saturation starts to decrease. And in fact, after 85 hours, um, we get down to 69%. Okay, so we produced more oil uh, in the second injection with the DI water than we did with the high, you know, we got 12% in the first one. In the second one, we got uh, about 
And uh, we were really at steady state over here. I think we've done some experiments where we've let it go on for a really long time and high salinity water is not going to do anything. So we're, we're actually seeing a decrease in saturation. Remember that we're using uh, visualization techniques, MSJ, to determine that saturation. We're not using mass balance because the uh, volumes are so small. Um, what using found is that there's a time delay and, and we do use the word time delay um, and, and not poor volume delay because we do believe it's a time delay. It is not related to um, the uh, to a size uh, poor volumes is that it, it's actually time. Um, so this is the oil saturation versus time hours. Um, these are the different experiments. Um, we have different salinities and um, what you can see um, is this over here. So low salinity water injection has a time delay but before producing significant oil. So you can see low salinity, okay, nothing happens, but then at some point it starts to, to decrease. The one at the top, this blue curve, was the high salinity flood. And that's what I alluded to in the previous slide. I said, we can inject high salinity for as long as we want. It reaches that steady state of around 88 or 90%. Uh, but these lower salinity floods make a, a big difference. And the uh, lower salinity, the um, it looks like the, the shorter the time delay. Okay, so um, let me start talking a little bit more uh, about these micromodels and things that we can do. Uh, there are a lot of important rock properties that are not typically included in micromodels. Sometimes they are, but they're, they're often not. One is three-dimensional features. Micromodels are usually considered two-dimensional, right? You can just you know, they lay flat and you can and, you know, visualize things. Um, but 3D features are important. We see them in core floods and it's important for capillary pressure barrier throats, capture snap off of residual oil, provides co continuity of the solid phase. Another thing that is sometimes included is heterogeneous pore structures. And more recently, um, a lot of people have used actual micro CT scans to replicate actual rocks in their micro models. But uh, for larger micromodels, this can be a challenge, as I'll discuss later. Uh, so uh, usually these micromodels are like a centimeter or smaller. OK, and so you have lots of end effects. Uh, very difficult to see flow behavior, displacement mechanisms that occur over longer time scales. Core floods, as I mentioned earlier in the lab, are usually about a foot long. Um, so it'd be great if we could create micromodels that were more uh, core flood like. Um, and the last thing is that micro models are not always, don't always have controllable wettability. Um, you know, so carbonate rocks have calcite surfaces. Um, you know, that changes the, um, you know, the wettability to mixed wet or oil wet. Uh, but we'd like to incorporate those in our micro models. And so what we have done in our group is try to tackle all of these so that we can make our core, our micro models more rock like, okay, more more like core floods, and so we have developed a way. And and Ke, um, the the PhD student I alluded to before, created what he calls two and a half D micro models, and so what that does is it allows us to um, have shallower pore throats than pore bodies. And this allows for snap off, which you can't get otherwise. Um, another is heterogeneous pore structure. Okay, I you can use micro CT scans, and a lot of people have done that. For the larger uh, micro models, which I'll talk about, that's very very challenging to do because you can't really. Um, it's very challenging to to do a C, micro CT scan of. Uh, maybe you know millions of pores. Um, so what we did is, is that we used an algorithm, a computational algorithm, to uh, create a heterogeneous pore structure. Uh, then to make longer micro models, we've developed what we call a core flood on a chip. And so that's what um, I'm showing here. Is is that our micro models, unlike many previous ones that are less than a centimeter, might be only a millimeter. These are a foot long in length, sometimes longer. So 30 centimeters. I think we've done as some as long as 40 centimeters. We could go big, bigger. So because of that, we can actually visualize things that occur over long length scales, which I'll show. And then um, finally, we can control the wettability um, through calcite coating. 
So um, I talked about this three 3D features, which we believe are extremely important. Uh, most micro models are two dimensions. Um, we have been able to show a number of ways that um, you need those features to have capillary snap off. So one thing we did is we investigated this and um, you really need um, throat depth uh, required for, for snap off. So you would need a very deep um, micro model to have any snap off in two dimension. That's what I show over there is that the uh, thickness of that micro model, if it's less than twice the throat radius, there's no snap, snap off. And, and it's really not practical to have micro models that are um, super, super deep, okay? And so what we've done is we've derived this analytically. We've verified it computationally with finite element or lattice Boltzmann simulations, and we validate it with microfluidic experiments. And so uh, we've been able to show the criteria you need for snap off. And practically speaking, it's very difficult to get it in a two dimensional micro model. So that's what led to co developing these two and a half D micro models. And if you remember at the beginning of this talk, I alluded to these etching that creates these 45 degree um, uh, you know, chips, which many people find annoying. Uh, Ke took advantage of that and was able to, to do two of those close together and he can control the depth of the throat versus the poor body. And um, he's actually been able to verify um, that uh, the that he can get the, the throat depth and the poor body depth in that ratio exactly where he wanted it. And so now you've got grain, you know, you have pores and throats and they've got different depths. And in that sense, it's what we call two and a half D or it's got three dimensional features. And that allows us to have a capillary snap off um, regardless of the depths. And so that's what we see there. So in our uh, lab on a chip paper, we showed that we create two equivalent micro models, one that's 2D, one that's um, 2.5D, use the same fluids, similar geometry other than the 2.5D, than the, than the and, and we were only able to get these isolated residual oil capillary trap droplets for 2.5D micro models. Uh, so, We've incorporated that in a lot of our micro models. So now what I'm going to show is our core flood on a chip. So we do our AutoCAD design. This is, you know, this is about the size of a, a credit card maybe. Okay, but because of the serpentine behavior, um, this is really a foot long. Okay, or this one might even, yeah, this is about a foot long, um, 30 centimeters or so. And um, if you zoom in, you know, that's the CAD design and it's got heterogeneities in there because of the uh, of the algorithm that um, that we created to create heterogeneities based on a geostatistical uh, information. Um, you've got throats and, and pores. This is two and a half dimensions. So in a lot of ways, this has properties of a of a of a core flood, right? So you, it's about a foot long. It's heterogeneous. It's got three dimensional properties. We're getting more uh, core flood like. Um, so the question is, is that, you know, why do we do a core flood on a chip, right? Why, why do we do a foot long instead of just these centimeters? Well, some core scale behavior is not visible in small micro models. Um, so one of the things I'm showing here is we're able to actually visualize some fingering that occurs. So what we're doing is injecting some low vis viscosity water, displacing some oil. You start to see fingers form at a larger scale. That'd be very difficult to do in less than a centimeter. Um, here's another case where we look at um, oil banking, and I don't know if I have a video here yet. Let me see. Maybe not yet, but it's coming up. So um, you can see over here on the right, that what we get is we can visualize an oil bank, right? So you've got uh, low saturation over here, you've got this saturate, you know, but a high oil saturation, that's your oil bank that forms. Um, so you can actually visualize that. Difficult to see in a micro model that's, you know, one centimeter, difficult to see in a core flood, 
but you know clearly visible in this particular case. In this core flood in a chip, we can do um, all of our standard core flood experiments. We can measure pressure drops that allows us to determine permeability, right, from the slope of a permeability versus flow rate curve. Um, by the way, you can um, sort of predetermine your permeability because we, we create our geometry, but you can measure it as well. Uh, we could do tracer tests. Um, and so we've done some, um, you know, kind of fluorescent injections and you're able to look at um, that. So on the top, uh, what I have is a tracer test from a micromodel and the bottom is from a core flood. And from those, you can determine the heterogeneity uh, or, you know, I should say you, you can um, uh, kind of back determine or infer the heterogeneity. You can calculate the porosity, although the porosity is something that you can set ahead of time and use from imaging as well. Um, I'll go through this just very quickly. This was our, our network algorithm that I talked about, about creating that, that heterogeneity and how we do that. But in the interest of time, I'll go through that quickly. Um, but I did want to show some kind of neat um, results here. So what we have over here is a surfactant flood. So this is a surfactant flood and a core flood on a chip you can actually visualize where those fluids are going. You're seeing some fingering that occurs there. Um, you can zoom in and you can see where the oil and the, um, and, the and the surfactant solution are. Let me see if I can get another video here. Uh, so that's coming in. You can see that surfactant solution coming in, resuming in at a small scale. We can actually visualize what's happening there. Um, and the other thing that this was work done by Lucas Mejia uh, when he was a PhD student here, he used these and he actually plotted the water saturation versus distance sort of in a like a, you know, these are 1D sort of Buckley Leverett kind of things. What you see here, I mean, you know, there's some scatter, but uh, we're seeing these oil banks form, right? So the water saturation is very low or the oil saturation is high and at different pore volumes you can actually see oil banks and, and you also see the oil banks over in here um, here we've added some polymer on the right so on the left we got surfactant only a lot of fingering right so a lot of oils being left behind if you add polymer to your surfactant solution we can actually see that mobility control um, much better sweep efficiency in addition to the reduction in residual oil, which you get from the surfactant. Um, in addition to the surfactant and the surfactant polymer floods, we did do some um, ASP floods. Um, in the interest of time, I won't go through um, all the details about how we did that, but um, we did describe it in Lucas's paper. Um, but we did two different kinds of experiments. We did some with the these bright field, um, and so you're seeing some viscous fingering um, that occurs over here. So we have an initial. We did experiments with different initial water saturation. So this is four percent, so mostly oil, forty three percent, and this is at sixty percent. So um, this is sort of after at residual, right? So we did you know, enough poor volumes of a water flood to get to, you know, residual. And um, what we see is that we see clear banks at intermediate and large SWI. Okay, here's, here are those videos. Let's see if, okay, you're forming these oil banks. Clearly those oil banks are forming. Um, then we use a fluorescent dye, and this is able to show the injectant traveling ahead of the oil bank. Um, so in these cases, it's sort of difficult to see over here. I think I've got it on the next slide maybe. Let me see. Yeah, this is good. So um, we're able to zoom in and look at this. And one of the things that Lucas found, which was really exciting and maybe surprising, is, is that the surfactant actually um, was found ahead of the oil bank. 
And so what we're seeing there is the oil bank, but in these um, over here, you were able to actually see surfactant in there. We were able to do that with that um, fluorescence. On, and here, here's a good video of that, I think. Let's see. Yeah, so this is a, this is zooming in ahead of our oil bank. Zooming in ahead of the oil bank, and we're clearly seeing surfactant mobilizing some oil in front of the oil bank. So um, I think that uh, some conventional wisdom in the past has been that, you know, there's no oil being mobilized ahead of the oil bank. It's all in the bank, and, and most of it is, but we do see some really neat stuff that happens um, ahead of that. I think in the interest of time, I'm going to skip this last part about polymer viscoelasticity. Um, but um, we have a, a couple papers where we discuss that. Um, but some of the key points I want to make about today's talk are, number one, that these glass chips that we create, they're inexpensive. They're transparent. We can see through them. We can take videos and pictures. We can tailor their wettability. Uh, they're relatively fast and, and simple to make. The image analysis that we do allows for visualization of not just static, but dynamic behavior. And we do it across various scales. We could zoom in and really look at what happens in an individual pore, or we could do things that happen over, you know, that whole core flood on a chip. Uh, we can virtually create any geometry we want to and we can include natural heterogeneities. If we want to, we can do a micro CT scan. We can use our computational poor network generator algorithm we wanted to. Um, I think others have done this, but I've thought about using some sort of machine learning to where maybe use a micro CT image of, of just a, a small part and then you're able to create the, the whole core flood on a chip. Uh, the 3D features we believe are critical. Okay. Most in the past, most micro models have been two dimension, but we believe they're important for snap off, for continuity of the grain phase, and the fabrication process we created is extremely simple and inexpensive. Uh, we were able to create this, uh, this novel core flood on a chip. These are a foot long, they had a genius, they've got the 3D features, um, in that sense, they're more rock-like. They're not replacements for core floods, but they're more rock-like and they're good screening tools. Um, we can visualize behavior over long 30 to 50 meter scales. We can look at pressure drops. We can look at oil saturations um, using our image analysis software. We can do tracer concert concentrations versus time. All the same things we could do with a core flood. Um, and in that sense, I think that they could be good screening tools, right? So you test certain things, the ones that look promising, then you take and do your core floods. Uh, here we investigate a little bit about nanoparticles, some low salinity water, some polymer floods, ASP floods. I didn't get a chance to discuss it, but we've done, done quite a bit um, uh, with CO2 applications such as precipitation and dissolution. Uh, a few of the references that I had in here are shown here. I just like to acknowledge the many students and postdocs that have worked on this. Um, you know, I apologize for any that that I left out because there's just been so many that have done really fantastic work, and this was a, a combination of, of all their works. But um, with that, um, I appreciate your time, and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. One question is there are there any are there differences in results of flooding due to, due to the serpentine shape of the micro model and compared to say a straight micro model? Um, you know that's a good question. We are unable to we, we haven't created a, a foot long micro model that that's, that doesn't have any sort of serpentine behavior. So that's difficult to to say for sure. What we do know is that when we first did this, there were sort of right angles. So it was kind of like a straight edge and then a right angle and then another straight edge. When we did do that, we had some problems at the corners. 
uh, they're at least minimized when um, when we do it this way. Um, so when we've got this sort of uh, curved edges, we, we don't see very many effects um, at those turns as much as we did when we had the right angles. So the next question is, is that how long can you make your core flood on a chip? Um, so um, we have made them as long as 40 centimeters, but I don't necessarily think that there is a um, restriction on length. If we wanted to go longer, we could. Um, it's really just a matter of, um, you know, the kind of footprint you want to take up there. Uh, the next question is, what is the low permeability limit of the micro models? We haven't tested that, but um, theoretically, there really is no limit. We can control that in our AutoCAD design. Uh, I, I think millet RCs are, are relatively simple. Uh, if you go to nano Darcy's, if you're trying to look at shales, that's going to be much more challenging. Uh, now, about a decade ago, um, uh, I co-supervised a PhD student that did some uh, nanoscale microfluidics, but those were just microfluidics, not micromodels. But, um, uh, you know, milladarcies, um, you know, that kind of thing should be very doable. So uh, the next question is, can you test mixed wet abilities in the same chip as are sometimes seen in unconventional lithologies? Um, we haven't done that, but short answer is yes. Um, I don't see any reason why we can't do that. We really have a lot of control in these um, micro models. And as I mentioned, you know, the, the, the glass chips are, you know, by default, they tend to be water wet. But um, you can tailor that. You can tailor it a few different ways, actually. So one thing that we can do is you can age it with crude oil in the same way we do rocks. And we've done that and we've changed the um, the wet ability, but also we can use calcite and we can tailor where that occurs. So absolutely you can make these um, mixed wet and, and really make whatever you want from that. And that's the great thing about these micro models is that unlike with a rock, which is you, you you use what you've got, right? You, you don't really find out what you have until you test it. Uh, the the geometry, the size, the wettability, those are all things that we have control over. And then if we want to do comparison experiments, we can, for all practical purposes, create exactly the same chip. That way we're comparing apples to apples, whereas in a, in a rock core flood, you, you take two rocks from, from maybe the same um from the same place and they might have very different uh pore structures permeabilities porosity and that kind of thing um are the two two and a half d micro models expensive and complicated to fabricate um well they're not complicated because i just i just have my students do it for me um i'm joking of course but um it, it, it's a not particularly um, challenging. I mean, it takes a little bit of time to do it, but um, to, to learn it, I should say. But um, once you learn it, it's no more complicated than the other micro models. And uh, I've probably had a half a dozen PhD and uh, postdocs um, fabricate these. And um, it, it's once you learn how to do it once, it's um, not particularly challenging. How does low salinity time dependent response scales to a field level low salinity flood? OK, so that's a really good question. Um, it's been a while I looked at this. I want to give a good answer, but the short answer is, is that it is a time dependent behavior. So that, that's one of the things that we found is it didn't matter that we were doing things in a micro model, whether it be in a field scale. Um, it's not poor volumes injected, it's actually time. And, and, um, and we found that it was on the order of hours to days. But um, yeah, so um, yeah, and, and so in that sense, um, that's how it affected. But we, um, we haven't done any large scale simulations or anything, I don't think, regarding this, but it is a time 
delay type of thing. So the next question, I, I don't think I have a great answer for. So it's in nanoparticle injection, what sort of problems can you have? Um, I think that's pretty broad and, and not entirely sure where we're getting at there. For From our perspective, we don't really have any problems in terms of the microfluidic device. Um, you know, the, the nanoparticle solutions are homogenous and, you know, the nanoparticles don't plug up anything or anything. So we don't have any problems with injection um, in that context. Okay, so the next question is, any testing on low salinity at different temperature an impact on the results? So uh, answer there is no. Uh, we have done everything in ambient. Um, we've tested different salinities and, and seen the effect there. That was a plot I've shown. We have not done higher temperatures, but as I mentioned before, that's something that we'd like to do and we know how to do it. So next question, thanks for the presentation. What is your thoughts on a big porous area, for example, 20 centimeters on the glass chip rather than two centimeters? Um, well, of course, that was kind of the point of the core flood on a chip is having those bigger scales. And I would say the biggest thing that we were able to see is things that develop over longer scales. So things like viscous fingering, uh, oil banks, um, develop miscibility. Those kinds of things, um, you know, are going to develop over longer scales and having a, a larger uh, porous domain of 20 centimeters rather than two allows us to, to visualize some of those things. Okay, well, um, I just like to, to thank everybody for, for their time. Uh, this will be posted on YouTube, so feel free to share this with any YouTube and with any uh, colleagues that you have. And um, I just like to state again, I'm excited to work with uh, Hugh Daigle in his new role as director of the center.